Okay, so now we are going to move on to uh, De Lewis and Guattari and <clears throat> uh, Leotard and um, Virilio, Shulamith Firestone, uh, and a variety of other um, uh, kind of radical philosophers of, of love and sexuality from the 60s through the 80s. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we'll start off with Deleuze and Guattari. And uh, this is, uh, this first one is the excerpt from, uh, most of these readings are from a collection called Polysexuality, uh, which was uh, meant to be a kind of um, overview of, uh, and oh, sorry, and also uh, uh, Guy uh, Hockingham, um, who wrote Homosexual Desire and uh, To Destroy Sexuality. Um, so the first one is Deleuze and Guattari, uh, Voted Oedipus. And um, this one is meant to be, uh, uh, like a lot of Deleuze and Guattari's works, it's meant to be a critique of Freud uh, and Freud's, uh, what they conceive to be Freud's um, sort of bourgeois, Western, uh, kind of capitalist, uh, uh, normative ver version of psychology um, that he called psych psychoanalysis, uh, which, um, you know, to, to many people at the time uh, was considered to be liberating, but Deleuze and Guattari were arguing <clears throat> that it wasn't necessarily that liberating because um, uh, <clears throat> because it was based in heteronormativity, it was based, you know, it was kind of anti-gay, anti-lesbian, uh, and um, had a lot of other uh, problems that they wanted to address. So, um, so a bloated, bloated Oedipus uh, starts off with uh, starts off by discussing Kafka's letter to his father, in which he says that uh, he threw himself into dissatisfaction, which uh, Deleuze and Guattari read as uh, an Oedipal kind of statement, uh, but not only Oedipal, because for them, behind the family triangle, which is uh, mommy, uh, mommy, daddy, baby. Um, behind that family triangle are, are other infinitely more active triangles from which the family borrows its power. Uh, and so he points out that in Kafka, there's uh, the triangle of judge, attorney, and accused. Um, and there's any number of uh, kind of ongoing uh, triangles of power that are similar to uh, the kind of nuclear family that, that Freud uh, tended to focus upon. Um, but for Deleuze and Guattari, they want to argue that this, this image of the family as being the central and only form of power uh, uh, is, first of all, it's referring to a very specific type of family uh, and one that even, you know, most people don't uh, experience it in quite the idealized way that Freud imagined uh, because most people don't uh, come from income backgrounds that are sufficient enough to maintain a stable family with no breakups and no divisions and no um, uh, no problems, essentially. So, um, so they reject psychoanalysis's uh, depoliticization of the family. And they emphasize the triangle form above all, uh, which is expressed for them in quote the American technocratic machine, um, and they also say the Russian bureaucratic machine. Uh, so, when the family triangle is undone, uh, other triangles take over. They say. And behind it all is not just a, is not a final system or a final model, but <clears throat> but a quote infinite and ungraspable hierarchy. And they say this is really exemplified in Kafka, uh, uh, his father uh, being uh, a rural Czech Jew, for example, who migrated to Germany, uh, only to find that he's hated by all uh, kind of all sides once he does that, because uh, not only is he now left uh, uh, the Czech Republic and uh, Czechoslovakia, and therefore is um, sort of alienated from Czechs, also alienated from Czech Jews, but also in Germany where he's arrived now, he's um, he's seen as a foreigner, uh, uh, not only in the fact that he's not German, but also in the fact that he's not Jewish, or sorry, that he is Jewish. Uh, so he's, he's not only not a German, he's also not a German Christian. Um, <clears throat> so he's kind of alienated in all these different ways. So it's a kind of infinite... Uh, and uh, multiply, uh, <clears throat> multiply, multiplying and, and diversifying uh, type of hierarchy that we find throughout Kafka. 
and they use this as an example to critique Freud and to critique the kind of what they see as simplistic, you know, Western bourgeois Christian uh, kind of privileged image of the family. Um, and so what they say is that we need a, uh, a quote, comic enlargement of the Oedipal Triangle, not a fetishization of it. So um, doing this, uh, if we do this and we, and we try to understand how power functions in a much more complex way than that, uh, this will allow uh, a line of flight uh, towards, <clears throat> towards becoming animal, uh, so that rather than uh, firing one's head and remaining a bureaucrat, inspector, judge, and judged, or remaining uh, subject to a bureaucrat, inspector, judge, and judged, um, that we instead can become animal or can become some other form of uh, more minor or minority type of um, identity. Uh, but not identity. For them, it's not really about identity. It's about uh, escaping from uh, the kind of uh, categorizations that power imposes upon us. Um, so he says that uh, but he says that this is very complex because uh, Kafka's father, for example, uh, deterritorializes or uh, you know takes a line of flight or takes flight from uh, his subjugation as a rural Czech Jew. Um, but then he, but then in the process, he re he reterritorializes his family, his customers, uh, and he also becomes uh, an object of oppression of other people. Um, so there's really kind of no escape from. From these types of hierarchies and these types of uh, authority, um, uh, it's just in a constant state of motion between between uh, tr uh, people trying to uh, evade power and and reject power and fight back against power, and then they themselves becoming uh, be becoming um, uh, authority figures in various ways to other people. So it's kind of like there's no end to politics. Politics is kind of continuous no matter what. Um, so they say. Uh, so what they what they argue though, for though as a type of resistance is what they call becoming. They say becoming is a seizure, a possession, an additional value, and never a reproduction or an imitation. And um, they cite the short story by Kafka called *Metamorphosis*, which is the one in which uh, uh, Gregor becomes a <clears throat> he becomes like a, a beetle or some type of insect uh, in the story. Um, and this derives basically from his family feeling alienated from his family and he feels uh you could say that it's uh that it's a metaphor um that he's kind of uh, imagining himself to be nothing but an insect compared to the family the other members of the family uh or you could say that in becoming an insect becoming animal <clears throat> he is uh kind of escaping the very types of categorization that the family would impose upon him um so uh so but they point out that in, in the actual story, when the family uh, kind of exits the scene, uh, three bureaucrats enter the scene. So there's this kind of re-edipalization or uh, re-territorialization of, uh, of the family by, by new figures of uh, power and, dom and domination and authority um, in the figure of the bureaucrats. Uh, so, he, um, so he emphasizes that uh, that this attempt to become animal is uh, becomes blocked uh, or, or failed, and um, but nevertheless, uh, becoming animal is uh, or becoming insect in that case um, for delusionary is a form uh, of resistance, and um, this brings us to the the next short uh, selection called becoming woman, and um, and here in this one. Uh, they, they basically argue that becoming woman is the uh, is the most important type of becoming minoritarian or becoming minor, um, and uh, uh, it's the most important because uh, because it's kind of the pathway to all of the other ones for them. So they argue that um, that uh, even homosexuality, most of homosexuality for Guattari is still controlled by the norms of heterosexuality. Uh, and is overcoded by it. So, for example, uh, the fight for gay marriage, uh, uh, rather than um, homosexuality being uh, 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 a, 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 being a practice or a culture or uh, something like that, that that, um, that entirely resists heterosexual norms, actually becomes uh, starts to conform to it and tries to reproduce it within the framework of homosexuality. So. Um, uh, they point out that 
uh, again, they critique Freud and, and psychoanalysis, and they say that Freud and psychoanalysis make homosexuality a matter of perversion rather than something that uh, is valuable in and of itself. And they say that um, militant homosexuality, uh, which is the kind that they are arguing in favor of, allows for an alliance with feminists, allows for uh, alliance with people from the third world, uh, and uh, kind of all against uh, patriarchal uh, heteronormativity um, and uh, heterosexual enforcement of um, conventional norms. So they opt for uh, what they call a type three, uh, which instead of being a kind of normative type of homosexuality is instead of what they call molecular homosexuality. And this is one in which uh, categories are more fluid, um, uh, allowing for resonance between uh, homosexuals, transvestites, uh, which is the term that they use at the time. Today, we would probably say transgender, um, drug addicts, uh, uh, kink, uh, kink people who are into kink, uh, prostitutes, women, men, children, teens, artists, revolutionaries. Uh, in other words, resonance between all, uh, all minorities, all sexual minorities, uh, uh, and for them, um, the only sexual type that there is is sexual minorities, uh, and that would include heterosexuals and men, um, insofar as they, sec they are sexual, are, uh, are still sexual minorities for <clears throat> delusionary because they have a, a kind of um, a very complex type of uh, way of thinking the universal earth, or of thinking universality. And they argue that uh, all sexualities are closer to the homosexual side of the hetero homo binary and also to a feminine becoming. Uh, and I assume that the reason for this is that uh, sexuality as such is coded as feminine, um, uh, regardless of uh, whether it's homosexual or not, or whether it's feminine or not. It's still uh, always already feminine in one way or another. Um, and they say that uh, the social body um, ca captures libido uh, in phallocracy, which means within within kind of a, uh, a male-centric um, framework, while the sex body uh, sends it towards becoming woman, uh, which Deleuze and Guattari see as the, the screen, quote unquote, of all, other, of all other becomings. All other becomings have to pass through becoming woman. Um, and this is because a uh, woman is so close to phallic power or male power. Um, so it so it plays this intermediary role uh, as it does in the claim that um, like when somebody says that the receiving partner in the homosexual act is quote unquote like a woman. Um, for them, the reason why that's stated in that way or analogized to be to being similar to being a woman is because woman is the woman is the passageway to all other forms of becoming minor. For them, so um, so only via becoming woman uh, can a man become uh, become music, become cosmos, uh, become all the other types of minor becomings, become animal that um, that they emphasize as forms of resistance. They say that uh, the point of becoming woman is uh, is that of quote an escape route from the repressive socius as a possible access to a minimum of sex to becoming. And as the as the last buoy vis-a-vis -vis the established order, uh, it's, so it's not the category of woman as in man versus woman, but it's more like the feminine is what they mean by that. Um, so uh, and to them, this is kind of a symbolic order as well. So uh, woman is uh, to them as um, or sex, you could say, or gender is uh, even more primary to them than uh, class or caste um, and that kind of thing. And uh, so, so again, they're, they're always, um, you know, they're never talking about kind of actual categories per se. They're talking about sort of virtual categories or cultural categories. So when they say woman or becoming woman or becoming animal, they're not, they don't mean actual animals or actual women per se. They mean more like the feminine or the, the non-human quality of the animal. Uh, that's what they mean. So they say, and this is, and they also say the same thing with, when they say homosexual, they don't necessarily mean uh, uh, this individual homosexual here. They don't mean that per se. They mean uh, that which exceeds heteronormativity. Um, so there could actually be things within heterosexuality that, that in the way that they're framing it, 
uh, are homosexual or are, in other words, are non-heteronormative aspects within particular heterosexual practices of various kinds. So, <clears throat> so that leads them to say, for example, we shouldn't ask which writers are homosexual, but rather what is it about a great writer, even if he's in fact a heterosexual, that is homosexual. Um, so again, it's not talking about individual identities. It's talking about that which resists the sort of dominant order of heterosexuality, of whiteness, of, uh, <clears throat> of phallocracy, as they say, uh, meaning patriarchy. Um, so Guattari thinks that uh, we should sort of destroy overly inclusive categories or, or large categories like woman, uh, homosexual, because um, when they're reduced to binaries of woman versus man or homosexual versus heterosexual, uh, there's always some other motive for him. And uh, he says the real point of uh, creating an op uh, opposition between, uh, say, woman and man, homosexual and heterosexual, is to um, <clears throat> is to subjugate the homosexual, to subjugate the woman, and also to subjugate the feminine aspects of of of, of a man, or of or of the non heteronormative um, qualities of a heterosexual, so that everyone is kind of oppressed in one way or another by these things, uh, whether or not they're women, whether or not they're homosexuals, um, because it's a, because it functions at, in a much more uh, pervasive and uh, uh, all-inclusive manner than, um, than what we might be used to thinking of today uh, with identity politics. Today, the way it's usually framed is that uh, some people are this and other people are that, whereas they're thinking, they're not thinking like that. They're thinking um, that everybody has aspects to themselves that, uh, that are feminine or that are uh, non-heteronormative, um, whether or not, wh whatever their identity might be. Uh, Okay, so moving on to how to make yourself a body without organs. This is another one of their sort of like images of resistance as a body without organs. So this means a body, uh, for Deleuze and Guattari, a body is um, a body is a body is something that uh, that is is in, kind of inherently resistant because. Uh, a body maybe resists imposed identities or resists imposed sort of normalizations or nor normalities that are kind of um, written onto the body. So they start off with uh, uh, a short play poem by Antonin Artaud called To Have Done with, with the Judgment of God. And this was uh, intended to be broadcast over French radio. Uh, it proved very controversial and it was uh, pulled by the French state just prior to its launch. Um, but the words were retained, and that's why we're able to read it today still and know what it was going to say. So its message was, uh, you know, sent, you know, it had some impolite language, uh, but it basically contradicted the idea that after the French Revolution, the uh, politics had parted ways with um, theology, and it basically says that uh, <clears throat> that the judgment of God is still sort of written into um, modern secular politics, and it's still kind of glares over us uh, in a way. So um, so this, so in doing so, this uh, uh, inadvertently uh, demonstrates that, um, that uh, the body hasn't been liberated from subjectivity yet and from identity yet. And uh, by and large, um, we still see uh, in accordance with uh, the utility uh, of identity, we still perceive in, in accordance with um, sort of the dominant identities. And uh, in our organs, you could say, have continued to prevail over our bodies, um, which might mean sex organs, uh, genitalia. Uh, we think of genitalia as being kind of all, all determining of, <clears throat> of how we should conceive of ourselves in terms of gender or how we should conceive of ourselves in terms of what type of sexuality we're supposed to have uh, and that kind of thing. And even if we are homosexual or uh, or, or something else, um, for Deleuze and Guattari, uh, typically uh, even people who, um, who are in minority positions tend to uh, normalize themselves and to assimilate and to, to, not be, um, to not be the more kind of full versions of themselves. So, um, so in this play poem, Artaud, uh, he describes a, a series of 
transformations from uh, pre-colonial to post-colonial America, from pre-nuclear to a post-nuclear world, from a theological culture to a secular culture. And all of these events take place uh, not only in the world, but also in, in the body. And um, so our comportment in our body changes each, has changed each time and will of course change again. And yet in many ways, it's also stayed the same. So uh, the Greeks renounced the realm of the body for the realm of the forms. You find that in Plato. Uh, you can even see that in uh, the way that in the symposium that we read at the very beginning of class, uh, how in the symposium, um, the point, uh, the end goal of love is basically love for God uh, in the end, uh, after passing through um, love for other people. Uh, in primary relationships and that kind of thing. Um, the Romans renounced the pleasures of the flesh for the purity of the soul. This is referring to Christianity. Uh, and Americans renounced the irrationality of the passions for the rationality of the intellect. Um, and so, uh, so as, as a result of this, uh, in the secular modern world, um, our bodies are still forsaken. Uh, and quote, the idea of being a body was suffocated in me. And as a result, we've been, we become overly organized, uh, or as the Mutari put it, uh, we've been wrongfully folded. Um, and as a result of that, we still don't know what a body can do. Uh, meaning a body, a body beyond identity, a body beyond uh, oppressive and exploitative power relations. Um, we still don't know what a body can do because it hasn't been, been given the chance. So if we were to overcome that process, um, if we don't, uh, if we were to affirm that we uh, don't have bodies, but we are bodies, uh, if we make ourselves into body minds, which is kind of an image that they get from Spinoza, then we have to um, basically accept the task of reinventing what a human being is. Uh, so the human must become unfolded uh, and uh, man must become disorganized. Uh, organized me me meaning uh, uh, must be, become able to think of oneself outside of the logic of patriarchy, outside of the logic of heteronormativity and that kind of thing. And uh, then the question being how, and Blues and Guattari say, by placing him for the last time on the autopsy table to remake his anatomy, uh, I say to re remake his anatomy, man is sick because he is badly constructed. We must make up our minds to strip him bare in order to scrape off that uh, an, an animal cule uh, the itches him mortally, God, and with God his organs. For you can tie me up if you wish, but there is nothing more useless than an organ. When you will have made him a body without organs, then you will have delivered him from all his automatic reactions and restored to him his true freedom. So in our, our Toad's formulation, to unfold the body, we have to disrupt these uh, things that organize, um, that organize our body uh, in ways that make us useful to power. Uh, <clears throat> we have to be able to become resistant bodies um, in various ways. All right, so moving on to moving away from Deleuze and Guattari and just Guattari himself to Leotard. Um, <clears throat> this text, uh, Use Me, uh, is about Daniel Paul Schreber, uh, who was a judge who lived from uh, the early 1800s to the early 1900s. And he, uh, at some point in his life, he became, uh, he was a very well respected judge. Uh, and, uh, but at some point he became schizophrenic and uh, he felt that he would like to experience um, receiving uh, sexual penetration uh, as a woman. Uh, he, he wanted to become a woman. And uh, so that, um, and then he eventually thought that he was becoming a woman and that God was sort of intervening through divine intervention. Um, and that as a result of this, that uh, God would have a, a sexual object of desire and that would be uh, Judge Schreber. Um, so, uh, so this is kind of a pretty early case of, uh, of transgender, uh, uh, transgender. Um, so, uh, all right. Um, so Leotard's comments on this topic, uh, actually a, a lot of the 60s, 70s, and 80s um, radical philosophers of sex and love, uh, like Lacan, Deleuze, Guattari, and others, uh, they've all commented on the case of Schreber. Um, and that being because uh, although Schreber was schizophrenic and, and uh, you know, mentally ill, uh, it's still a very interesting case um, because uh, 
still a very interesting case given how early it was. Um, so, uh, so Leotard uh, says that, you know, Schreber felt that the filling up of his body with uh, feminine voluptuous nerves increased the power of attraction of the divine rays, uh, thus accelerating his, his feminization. Um, and he points out that Schreber wanted to ex experience uh, pleasure as a woman and wanted to give God pleasure as a woman, uh, but that Schreber saw God, uh, his, um, he saw his therapist and, uh, uh, and this pimp that he imagined uh, as punishing him, which is um, a kind of enjoyable punishment uh, to feel freed from freedom. And, um, and what Leotard points out is that what disappears here is the illusion of an ego. So that uh, so Schreber exists only through God, pimps, and his therapist, um, and he wants to be uh, more woman, more prostitute, more mad, uh, more dead. And um, Leotard argues that uh, this can uh, still arrive from the horse and intimate throat of a woman saying "use me," and that what this means is uh, that there is no me, there is no ego. Um, and Leotard asks, so what does she want? She, she who demands to be used, what, is, what does she want? What is she actually asking for? Uh, and he says, you know, does she want to be the master of her master or does she want you to die with her? Um, and what Freud says is that, uh, that what woman wants is for the man to become neither man nor woman. Um, uh, so, quote, it would be more in accordance with the realization of desire in life and beyond uh, if we could be freed from the difference of sex and these celestial figures uh, never ask whether we are man or woman. That's a quote from Schreber. Um, Leotard uh, closes this short uh, comment with a critique of Freud's concept of the death instinct, which, uh, which was used in the Schreber case to uh, basically argue that the desire for uh, the destruction of patriarchy and heteronormativity is just a farce. Uh, uh, and instead of that, Leotard, much like Blues and Guattari, uh, want to take Schreber seriously, uh, even though this is even though this was written in a state of madness. Um, but they want to take him seriously to a degree, uh, because uh, uh, because um, because there because there is something potentially liberating in what he's saying here. So uh, so rather than rather than uh, Freud, uh, you know. Um, Leotard says that uh, the Greeks, Lenin and Trotsky, uh, quote, the gays who move in packs, uh, uh, all with their proper nouns of rulers, uh, all of them forget that the plea of the masses is not long-lived sociality, but long-lived libidinality. Uh, so libidinality, um, he has a book called The Libidal, Libidinal Economy, and um, uh, for him, libidinal desire or uh, sexual desire is a potentially revolutionary um, impulse. Um, so, uh, so when you think of the sexual revolution of the sixties, uh, you know, the free love movement, uh, gay rights movement, women's movement, uh, all of that, um, that's, that's what this is drawing upon what it's kind of, uh, referencing. Um, okay. And then, uh, Virilio's text, moving girl, this one, um, this is uh, kind of on the more conservative end, uh, although I mean, Virilio is a is also a radical, but his particular version of that he's uh, he's a, a Roman Catholic and um, <clears throat> and he's a phenomenologist, uh, so he's a little bit different from the other thinkers. And uh, uh, the big thing about Virilio that differentiates him um, is that he he's very focused on uh, he's very focused on um, the relationship between speed and power. So, uh, so he, 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 in throughout all of his works, he has different, uh, um, descriptions of, uh, different technologies in their relation to militarism and to power and how, how power and militarism, um, develop certain types of technologies, uh, in the direction of speed. And, um, the interesting thing for Virilio, like Deleuze and Guattari, uh, is that he sees um he does actually see uh, uh gender uh or, or sex as kind of at the origin of his entire uh framework um so the same way that Deleuze and Guattari say that uh sex and gender are even more primary than class and caste 
uh, Deleuze uh, Virilio says that um, in this sort of history of technology as a relationship between speed and power and, and uh, militarism, um, that the, the first vehicle, the first technological vehicle that increases the speed of human beings is woman. So, um, <clears throat> so that's why he starts off with this, uh, this story of, um, or that's why he calls it Moving Girl. So he starts off by talking about science fiction in the US and other uh, Western industrialized countries, uh, which he feels um, tend to show us uh, um, turning in circles like the blind before the very um, obviousness of the familiar universe. And that this uh, science fiction allows us to step into other, other universes uh, which are um, kind of uh, metaphors for what he calls um, the pure phenomenon of speed. So, uh, so for Virilio, science fiction uh, narratives often um, are referencing, referencing the book of Genesis and the Bible uh, via the role held by uh, the first woman. Uh, and and this, is, this is similar to uh, the relation to science and the technical media. So he says, first, first Satan seduces woman, who in, ter who in turn seduces man, uh, thus condemning humanity to disappearance, and <clears throat> which means that seduction is a rite of passage from one universe to another, which implies a decisive departure for humanity. Uh, you can see this. Um, so he's basically conjoining, uh, uh, you know, the earliest books of the Bible with um, science fiction, and the role that women play in both. Um, he says that a uh, woman is not possessive, possessed or possessing, but attractive uh, and the force of attraction that is um, gravitation, which is the basis for speed. Uh, so um, the body of woman is a, a vector between man and the new world uh, and uh, the territorial body. And he goes on and he cites uh, Elaine Schlockoff. Uh, he points out that there's been a replacement of um, porn film with horror films, that horror films have become uh, very widespread and that uh, fear, uh, the desire for fear has replaced the desire for sex. Um, but that really the, the porn film already kind of, um, uh, you could already see this coming in, in the porn film itself. Uh, and that this is, um, that you can see this also in this science fiction uh, book of Genesis uh, conjunction that he makes. Um, and he says that uh, uh, he goes through a variety of um, stories about kind of uh, contemporary uh, culture, such as punk. Um, he says punk is about uh, seduction, about attracting the look, uh, you know, be shocking somebody with the mohawk and the spikes and everything, um, uh, attracting the look in a universe that's perceived as illusory uh, rather than a universe that's perceived as real which is the way that Virilio sees it. Um, he says, uh, girls like guys pick them up, but only to uh, revel in a kind of um, uh, sexual hitchhiking. Uh, he says that uh, women, this is where I'm saying that he's conservative. Um, uh, although I'm not, I'm not sure this is really an evaluation, right? If it's, if it's not a moral evaluation, then it's not, then it's not necessarily conservative, but um, he might, he, he, you could read this in a lot of different ways, but uh, many parts of this, you know, made, to me made it seem that he was um, rather conservative and anti-feminist. Uh, so he says, uh, he goes on and says, women draw from the conjugal bed a hatred for the awkward husband, uh, like that of the transvestite or Travello or drag queen. Uh, he says the French women's liberation movement, the MLF says not that uh, woman is the future of man, that ma but that man is the past of woman. Um, the great navigation of the species. Uh, so, so basically what Virilio is doing here, it's kind of a, a dense text. Um, he's usually much more easy to read than this, but, uh, but basically he's looking at the militarization of society with woman as the first vehicle. Um, and uh, he cites the futurists, he says, uh, and this is, he's critiquing this there, here. Uh, he says, the heat of a piece of iron or wood uh, now arouses us more than the smile or tears of a woman. Uh, this is a direct quote from the Futurists, uh, which is the art movement in Italy, um, fascist art movement in Italy. Uh, he says the vehicle completely replace, replaces the beloved, uh, the mother landscape inhabited by the spirit of metamorphosis. 
um, so that uh, human beings are becoming more and more alienated from each other. Uh, and, you know, he has this one schema where he says that, uh, you know, that uh, extended family broke down into the nuclear family, and then the nuclear family broke down into the single parent family. Um, and now you might say with, with this example that uh, now it's not even that. Now we're just in love with our technologies, you know, our cars, maybe our smartphones, uh, our iPads. Uh, and we don't really have love for uh, for other human beings, per se. So he, he's pretty dark and, and pessimistic in this respect. Okay, and the final reading is uh, Hockingham to Destroy Sexuality. I also included the book uh, Homosexual Desire there, but uh, you definitely don't need to read that because it's extremely long. Um, and Destroy Sexuality, to Destroy Sexuality is an excerpt from that book but it's also included in the polysexuality PDF. So whether you read it from the book or you read it from, <clears throat> from the polysexuality edited collection, uh, either way is fine, it's the same text. So, um, but the, and that's also where I'm gonna draw the, um, the test from. So in To Destroy Sexuality, uh, Hockwingham argues that capitalism appears to be tolerant, but it's, but it's always actually uh, controlling life through sexuality. Uh, as well as emotion, expression, affect, and and uh, in the way that capitalism um, has this sort of combined uh, tolerant appearance, but also a kind of controlling uh, uh, effect. Uh, this ends up crippling all of us, uh, cutting us off from our bodies, cutting us off from our desires. Um, <clears throat> he says that capitalism uses social terror uh, and the kind of uh, inculcation of guilt into individual uh, people to neutralize um, more egalitarian forms of, uh, and more liberated forms of, of desire and of will. And uh, this leads us to um, uh, direct the revolutionary struggle against capitalist oppression, where it's most deeply rooted in the living flesh of our own body. So Hockingham, uh, it, Hockingham is drawing heavily on Deleuze and Guattari here. Uh, and uh, he sees himself very much as in league with them. Um, so if you do the work to understand Deleuze and Guattari, you will understand Hockingham uh, to a very great extent as well. Um, so he says that uh, so he says that capitalism uh, is kind of at war with with the body, and especially with the kind of Spinozan um, uh, capacity of the body, uh, capacity to be affected, and therefore to also affect the world. Um, and capitalism tries to uh, impose, uh, uh, to, to kind of attack the body and, and uh, uh, to inculcate guilt into us so that we um, don't pursue uh, uh, non-heteronormative or non-patriarchal desires. So he says um, that, uh, that he, they want to uh, free the space of the body from capitalist direction uh, and because of the fact that uh, one oppresses oneself in the current system, including in uh, revolutionary movements that don't conceive, that have no concept of a revolutionary body or a revolutionary sexual body. Um, and he argues that uh, queers, women, youth uh, are all fighting for a revolutionary body uh, and not just revolutionary consciousness, but a revolutionary body, meaning an actual physical, um, sexual, uh, emotional uh, body. Um, so he says, we are robbed of our, our mouths, our anuses, our sexual members, our guts, our veins, so they can turn them into parts for their ignominious machine, which produces capital, exploitation, and the family. They control, regulate, and occupy our mucous membranes, the pores of our skin, the entire sentient surface of our body, our nervous system as a relay in the system of capitalist, federal, patriarchal exploitation, and our brain as a means of punishment programmed by ambient power. Um, and he then refers to various body fluids uh, and energy as uh, kind of like revolutionary humors um, that are only allowed uh, to, uh, to be uh, excreted in uh, very controlled and specific manners uh, as opposed to a wide variety of them. Um, and he argues that the, the subject within ourself, meaning the, the identity that's kind of imposed and inculcated within us uh, with respect to sexuality and gender, 
uh, must be turned upside down. Uh, we must escape the sedentary uh, sense of ourselves uh, and become more nomadic in our, in our sense of sexuality, uh, in our sense of gender, to give way to what he calls uh, a limitless body, um, to live in the willful, willful mobility beyond sexuality. So when he says to destroy sexuality, he, he really means to destroy uh, sexuality as such, not just uh, heterosexuality, but also homosexuality in the way that homosexuality has been constructed by heteronormativity. Um, uh, so he says that uh, even when homosexuality is accepted in heteronormative society, uh, quote, we continually conform to the stereotypes of, of an official sexuality that controls every sexual experience from the conjugal bed to the bordello, uh, to say nothing of public toilets, discos, factories, confessionals, sex shops, prisons, schools, subways, etc. Um, so they don't want to simply uh, question official sexuality, they want to destroy it. Uh, because, quote, in the final analysis, it functions as an infinitely repeating castration machine uh, designed to reproduce everywhere and in everyone the unquestioning obedience of a slave. Um, so in this formulation, there's no uh, no real difference between, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, a kind of uh, 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 conventional um, uh, Puritan idea of sexuality, and on the other hand, a kind of uh, capitalist deployment of prostitution and that kind of thing. It's really two sides of the same coin. Uh, neither neither one of them is liberated, uh, and uh, what they're looking for is something very different from that. Uh, to rip out of ourselves the festering rumor of guilt that for thousands of years has been, has been at the root of all oppression. And so again, they're, they're rejecting this idea of guilt and uh, moralism um, that is usually used to, uh, to kind of shame people for, uh, for their, um, for their uh, minority sexualities or genders. Um, and he says that uh, he recognizes the link to feminism is uh, inseparably linked to liberating women and destroying male dominance and role models, uh, especially sexual role models. Uh, he says, we want to be rid of all roles and all identities based on the phallus. Um, we want to be rid of sexual segregation. We want to be rid of the categories of men and women, of gay and straight. Uh, we want instead to be transsexual. Um, autonomous, mobile, and multiple human beings with varying differences who can interchange desires, gratifications, ecstasies, and tender emotions without referring back to the surplus, that re without referring back to tables of surplus value or power structures that aren't already in the rules of the game. So um, that's a great example right there of <clears throat> radical philosophy of sexima uh, from the 60s. Um, even more even more so than Deleuze and Guattari, uh, I would say that text from Hockingham uh, really kind of captures the essence of that of that style of critique, uh, which is kind of it's almost kind of anarchist uh, uh, rejection of of all established norms. Um, okay, and then this final one from uh, Shulamith Firestone, uh, she's kind of a, a lesser known uh, feminist um, compared to say Simone de Beauvoir or some other major figures like that. She also is, is a major figure, but she's just not quite as well known. So in this, um, the two chapters I had us look at, which is love and romance, uh, she um, uh, really kind of deconstructs uh, love and the way that love is, the way that love is very differently experienced by women and by men. Um, it's a little bit simplistic given, uh, you know, the complexity of contemporary understandings of gender, uh, and it's also kind of simplistic with respect to sexuality. But as far as heterosexual, um, male, female, you know, cisgendered uh, uh, understandings of, of love and romance, uh, there's value to it there. So she argues that um, love is the pivot of women's oppression, uh, even more than childbearing. And uh, she says that uh, while it's relegated to personal life, the fact is that um, women in love um, are, are under, underpinnings of the existing structure. Uh, so if you examine those two things, then you threaten the very structure of, of culture. And um, the idea that only men created masterpieces in art uh, uh, misses not only that they're 
uh, children were masterpieces and that women were barred from culture, but also that, quote, men were thinking, writing, and creating because women were pouring their energy into these men. Um, she uh, agrees with the old truism that women live for love and men live for work. Um, and, uh, but she says that this isn't really grounded in the individual psyche, the way that Freud sees it, uh, uh, be, uh, but is more complex than that. Nevertheless, there's some truth to that as well, uh, because uh, based upon the fact that the, um, the first attempt to, uh, to receive love or uh, maybe even sexual attention uh, from, uh, uh, from the mother is rejected. Uh, and because of this rejection, the, uh, the, the, the child um, then redirects this into work later in life uh, or a desire for a generalized love uh, or recognition rather than individual love. And this makes her think that, um, that men are kind of incapable of love because their, uh, their, their attempts at, at uh, uh, gaining love uh, early in life are thwarted by the mother. Um, she says that if women lived off of men, uh, men also live off women. Uh, so male culture is also parasitical off of women in the fact that uh, women provide emotional strength to men. Uh, they provide uh, material strength uh, by providing homes and providing food, uh, and they don't demand reciprocity. It's, it's uh, treated as a gift. Um, and she says that uh, men reject the female in themselves, uh, which leads them to not take love seriously uh, and, uh, and, and that in turn leads women to hate men for kind of posturing the world, posturing in the world as though they have no need for anyone else or anything else. Um, but, uh, like Nietzsche, she says that she's very critical of love and she says that love is, uh, not actually altruistic. It's actually the height of selfishness. The self attempts to <clears throat> enrich itself through the absorption of another human being. Uh, and love is uh, love is to be psychically wide open to another being, and so if you um, so it's going to be a hurtful encounter, no matter what, unless uh, uh, unless it is a, a truly mutual, equal exchange of selves. And in our society of patriarchy and of capitalism, it's basically impossible for for that to be the case, and therefore. Uh, love is uh, love is going to be selfish. It's going to be hurtful, uh, and it's not going to be liberated, um, according to Firestone, which is a lot like what Hockingham was saying as well. Uh, so she says that uh, lovers um, in love, lovers are temporarily freed from uh, isolation, and they feel that they can enlarge themselves through the other. They get an extra window on the world uh, and kind of enlarge their their understanding of things. Um, and, but, uh, because people are dissatisfied with themselves, uh, you know, this leads them to be, uh, kind of astonished at, at somebody else being very self-contained and self-possessed. Um, and that in turn eventually leads to envy, to hostility, uh, and then to possessive love, um, attempting to possess the other person. Uh, and that this uh, all kind of goes back in the end to a kind of sickness that uh, you know, ninety percent of love relationships, as she sees it, are uh, are, are really pretty unhealthy. Um, she argues that love is uh, is actually pretty simple, or could be simple, but it becomes complex due to uh, unequal balances of power between men and women, and uh, due to the fact that there's not um, there's not as much uh, vulnerability on the side of men. Uh, and also that in the original uh, Oedipal scene in Freud, which is the, uh, the baby and, and the, the uh, parents, that this plays out very differently for boys and girls. Um, and uh, so, uh, but either way, uh, whether they're boys or girls, um, the children as they grow up then begin this kind of lifelong uh, hunger for love or, or uh, journey for seeking love that uh, sends both sexes in this endless journey seeking to secure their egos and to feel that their egos will be um, respected and loved. And, uh, but because, because of rejection early in life, this, uh, that makes, this makes the male uh, scared to commit or to open up because he fears that he fears that he'll be rejected the same way that he was by his mother. And um, 
So to open up to her, according to Firestone, he has to degrade uh, the woman he encounters uh, in order to distinguish her from their mother, uh, from his mother. And uh, this, this leads to uh, love worship and to romanticism um, and, uh, and, and to that kind of thing. So, uh, so men uh, fall in love, um, which she uh, puts in square, scare, scare quotes because she doesn't uh, uh, really believe in this kind of idea and romantically idealize the object of their, of their attraction. She says that uh, women do this a lot, much less often. They don't really quote unquote fall in love, uh, but they might, um, but instead what they do is they might love but not fall in love because the image of falling in love to her is a kind of romantic uh, fake abstraction. So she says women do this much less often because they have no reason to idealize uh, uh, the man. Uh, whereas men do have a reason to idealize the woman uh, which is to, uh, and the point of doing that for her, according to her, is that, um, is that they, they have to bring the woman up from a kind of lower class, a lower sex class, uh, to the status of the man. So therefore, they must idealize the woman. And that's what falling in love means um, for her. So falling in love for her is actually sexist, uh, basically. And but not because not because uh, love is sexist or to love is sexist. She's not saying that loving is sexist, but she's saying that this image of falling in love um, is uh, is based in the sexist logic that um, that this one individual woman is is kind of an exception, is not like the other woman, uh, and therefore um, and therefore is worthy of being uh, taken on as a life partner. Um, so she says women do this a lot less often uh, since they don't have a reason to idealize uh, the one man to descend to a lower caste as men do to women. And thus um, falling in love is inauthentic. Uh, women don't fall in love, they just love. Uh, they love when it's appropriate to love. Um, uh, although uh, women's love as well is, is warped by this entire relation according to Firestone. Um, and then she says that uh, idealization uh, artificially equalizes the parties. So falling in love uh, voids the, the woman's class inferiority. And she can thus uh, only love herself if the man also finds her worthy of love and, uh, and doesn't suddenly feel that he sees through her, which is uh, she sees as that as something that kind of inevitably comes later in a relationship as a result of patriarchy, that uh, first there's the idealization and then later um, he sees her, uh, he sees the woman uh, for, uh, you know, in her full three dimensionality, which means that, um, which basically means that he notices that uh, she had other reasons to pursue the relationship other than just love. Um, and, uh, but for Firestone, that's just the way that things are because women are, are economically subjugated compared to men. And there's no way around that other than other than um, cre creating economic parity for both men and women. And maybe then there could be actual love. But for Firestone, as things are now, there, there can't really be uh, actual love relations, um, generally. I mean, occasionally. But uh, she seems to see, she seems to think that this uh, only really happens about 10% of the time. So uh, she goes on and she says that um, love has by no means the same sense for both sexes because men are not capable of love uh, and then women uh, are clingy but women are clingy because of the social necessity of being, being clingy because they don't have very many other options and they say that this has pretty much always been the case in patriarchal society even before capitalism um, but, uh, but men can't love because they can't fall in love uh, with their own projected image of perfection um, and as a result, they're unfaithful to prove they're still free. They're unpredictable to prove they're still free. And uh, they demand uh, the exact payment from the woman uh, in the form of um, insulting her and uh, looking at other women um, and not being faithful and that kind of thing. Um, 
So she says that he'll probably go to his grave feeling cheated, never realizing that there isn't much difference between one woman and another, that it's uh, that the only thing that really makes the difference is the act of loving itself. Um, but because men are incapable of love in many cases, or most cases, um, they, they'll never realize that. And uh, they'll just continue cycling through one woman after another and uh, never actually uh, commit to any one woman which means that they'll never really love uh, and that it's actually, and, and they'll never realize that love is what um, creates the difference between, between different women. Uh, okay, and uh, because women are a subordinated class, um, uh, it makes sense to her that they would uh, maybe choose to um, seek the approval of one man rather than many men in, in public, like, like the general kind of patriarchal society we live in. Uh, instead of seeking the approval of, of men as a whole, uh, just seeking the approval of, of one man. And to her, that makes sense from a class perspective, uh, if you see women as a class, which is the way that she sees it. Um, and she says, uh, economic inequality is what makes equal love impossible. Women don't have the choice between freedom or marriage, but, but simply between being public property or private property. Um, so women without men for her are kind of like orphans. Uh, they lack the protection of those who have power. Um, and she actually says that men are right when, when, when men complain about quote unquote gold diggers. Uh, she says that uh, women, are not, women are not actually free to love freely. Um, uh, she feels an empty space in his life, but her life is treated as though it's nothing. Uh, so they can't actually love freely, uh, and it's not actually their fault um, in the way that she frames it. She says it's, uh, she's lifted out of, the, out of the women class because she is now a member of the master class. Uh, but since this isn't freedom, um, uh, she, she is uh, revealed to not be as, as was expected, and the husband is left confused. Um, and she says that... Uh, uh, the traditional female games had a point in the old wives tale was that uh, a generous generous woman is respected but seldom loved and she thinks that that is actually accurate uh, and um, she says that uh, while men might appreciate emancipated women who become artists and intellectuals and activists and things like that uh, when they do marry they end up marrying marrying a more traditional um, type of woman who uh, who who um, uh, have a very different life than those who are quote unquote emancipated women who end up being used and sold out in the name of friendship. Uh, they gain nothing according to Firestone by imitating men and also lose their ability to love just like men have lost their ability to love. And uh, uh, so finally she just ends by saying love Love definitely means different things to men and women, and that's because men and women are in completely different positions in society. Um, and the final section is about romance. She says that uh, power and love don't make it together. Um, so if, when you have unequal power relations, love is not going to uh, function in the way that people think that it can or will. So when we talk about uh, romantic love, we mean love corrupted by the power context, by the sex class system, into a diseased form of love that then in turn reinforces the class system. She says romanticism develops uh, in proportion to the liberation of women for, from their biology. Um, uh, and so um, as technology has changed, made it more possible for uh, women to break out of their roles for good, uh, romanticism actually um, uh, becomes intensified as a result, uh, because the, because the possibility of women's liberation is closer than ever before, so therefore, uh, this kind of um, idealization and romanticization of love um, uh, becomes more uh, more intensified um, as a way to keep uh, women from knowing their actual condition. Uh, instead of that, uh, what you get is romanticism. So, all right, that's the lecture for. Uh, week six, and um, I will send out the test pretty soon.